Today is a tough story. I think it's only fair that I preface that if there's anyone that would be uncomfortable or if they have any young people that they think it's uncomfortable to have them here for a particularly ugly and explicit story. So I want to preface that. I did in all the services. There's a handful of stories in the Bible that are pretty ugly, and this is one of them. Genesis chapter 38. We started the story of Joseph, but we're interrupted with something about Judah, Judah and Tamar. And even though it's an ugly story, everything in the Bible is intentional. And so there is incredible purpose by which this chapter is here for us. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us. Your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. May we allow it to pierce us and challenge us and encourage us and uplift us to be closer and more like you. We want to be closer to you, Jesus. We will take your scriptures, your word, and your name and lift it high. You are worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor. So we give it to you and ask, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way that you would fill my mind with humility and wisdom and that we together would be edified by the studying of your word. Do what you want to do, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. And everybody set. All right, 11 o'clock. All right. Verse one. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira, There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. So he's in the Canaanite area. Sketchy. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. And again, another son and named him Shelah, which is probably Shelah, but I just can't help but say Shelah. Shelah. It was at Kazib that she gave birth to him. This is a big deal. Judah... One of the 12 brothers. So we're studying Joseph. We'll continue until the rest of Genesis to study Joseph. But Judah is one of the other of the 12 brothers, the sons of Jacob, the 12 brothers that become the 12 tribes of Israel. Class in session. So he gets married. He gets a best friend. He gets three kids, three sons. Big deal, especially in the culture. Verse 6, Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn. And her name was Tamar. And there's the second main character of the story. You might have your own subtitle right here, Judah and Tamar, the daughter-in-law. But Ur, the firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. That sounds kind of Old Testament. A lot of people struggle with the Old Testament because God did a lot of like heavy things in the Old Testament, like just kill people because they're wicked. First of all, the cross does change everything. Second of all, the New Testament has the same kind of stories. You're lying, drop dead. Spouse comes in, you're lying, drop dead. That's perspective on us being such sinful human beings. Like we don't deserve anything. We deserve at any point to just drop dead because we've sinned against the holy God. So every breath really is a gift. So God decides in justice to kill Ur, the firstborn, because he's so wicked, which makes sense because he's from a group of people that are very wicked. We'll get to that later. Verse 8, then Judah said to Onan, the second son, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. That's culturally expected and traditionally normal. Even in the Bible, in Deuteronomy 25, God said, I want you guys to do this. If there's a widow, if there's a brother of the man who died, he can marry her and have children to continue the name of the brother who passed away. The principle of this is more important. The principle is always the most important. I think that the principle of this is because the Jewish people, it was all about God's chosen people and the purpose of God choosing the people was for them to be people of faith and to have a relationship with God. And so if that's representation of what God wanted for all humanity, I would think the principle of carrying on the name and fulfilling this Um, kind of lineage, destiny for your brother's sake would probably be like the idea of passing on faith from generation to, to generation. Regardless, it was an expected thing. However, verse nine, 
Onan knew that the child would not be his, so whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Tony, no rush at all, but can you get me a cute little cup of water in case I start coughing? My throat's all ugh, today. And I had my monkey cup. I don't even know where my monkey cup is. Oh, it's over there. I'll take a regular cup, even though I like my monkey cup from Costa Rica. Shout out to the Costa Rica church that gave us gifts. We take our zeal school of ministry to that same place every year, and they give us gifts every year. Sorry, ADHD, too much. The wicked thing that the second son did was not particularly wicked because of what he did, but the reason that he did it. The principle is what matters. He is directly disrespecting, first of all, Tamar, poor girl. Second of all, his father, who commanded him to fulfill the tradition. Third of all, his brother, who's dead. And last, and certainly not least, I would say most of all, the Lord himself, who instilled this principle. So he is completely wicked, living on his own, doing what he wants, knows the son's not gonna be his anyways, so just what a terrible thing to do. And God doesn't like it so much so, God says, I'm gonna kill you too. Verse 11, Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah recovered from his grief, he went to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his best friend, Hira, and the Adulamite went with him. Thanks, homie. Shout out to Tony DeFranco. Shout out to Pastor Tony. Oh, that's good stuff. Verse 15, I think. Am I right? Thanks, 13. So yeah, he goes to Timnah. So I wanted to say, Timnah is a Philistine area. So it's not really like a good choice. When his wife dies, he decides to go with his best friend to Timnah with the homies that are shearing the sheep. Verse 13, Tamar is told, your father's going to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she takes off her widow's clothes, covers herself with the veil to disguise herself and sits at the entrance of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. So Judah made the promise to take care of the situation with the third son, but then actually didn't do anything about it. So she's like, well, I'm gonna do something about it. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought that she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. This is normal in the culture, different than in our culture. The areas that he's involved in are, are wicked people and they worship sex gods and had shrine prostitutes that were an expected thing because of the worship of the sex gods. And like that, that religious practice was part of the culture. In our culture, prostitution is still kind of a behind the scenes hidden thing, but there it's normal. He's like, oh, must be a shrine prostitute. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, verse 16, he went over to her by the roadside and said, come, let me sleep with you. And she said, what are you gonna pay me? Basically, he said, I'll give you a goat, which is our m version of the money payment for sleeping. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? What pledge do you want? She said, your seal in its cord and the staff in your hand, which is basically kind of have like your driver's license and credit card to prove that you're gonna you know, bring that payment back since you don't have the payment right now. Because the seal and the cord and the staff, those are very, very personalized items in that day. Nobody else had the same seal that Judah had. Nobody else had the same staff. So she gave them, he gave them to her and then he slept with her and she became pregnant. Uh-oh. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes and basically went back home and kept doing normal life. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he didn't find her. So his friend asked the guys that lived there, where's the shrine prostitute? But they said, there's not a shrine prostitute here. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. And besides, the guys said they don't even have a shrine prostitute here. Verse 23, Judah said, all right. Let her keep what she has or we will become a laughingstock. After all, I did send her the goat, 
but you didn't find her. Like, I, I did what I could. You know, we did what we could. Let's just forget about it and move on. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution and the result is that she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out here and burn her. Sure about that, buddy? Like, and exactly what you would hope happens does happen. She comes up, verse 25, and as she's brought out, she says, I'm pregnant by the man that owes these. Like, I don't know, owns these. I don't know if you, um, I don't know if you recognize this card, this driver's license right here. It has someone's name on it. Maybe, just let me know if you know who that is. So he gets smacked with humility. Verse 26 recognizes what she brings up and says, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Sheila and he did not sleep with her again. So it's not to say necessarily that Tamar is perfectly righteous because she did this, but it is a point that he makes. She at least did something. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife tied a scarlet thread around and said, this one came out first. But he drew back his hand, and then his brother came out. So she said, oh, so this is how you've broken out, and named him Perez, which means breaking out. And then his brother, who had the scarlet thread, came out afterwards, and he was named Zira, which means scarlet or brightness. Hmm. Do me a favor and give a little extra kiss for me. My homies over there. Man, what about this story, huh? What about this story? Why is this story in the Bible? If you've never heard of this story and you're not asking that question, I question if you're a sane person. Like, how could you not question why this story is in the Bible? This is as ugly as it gets. I thought the Bible was all pristine and nice. It's... The Bible's legit. It's legit. But why still? Why is there such a terrible story? And why is it in the middle? We just started the story of Joseph. Like, what's going on here? Anyone naturally would think that. And then naturally you would think, as I did, you think about the story and you try and answer the why question from the story. So you go through the whole story of, okay, this happened and they did this and they did that and that's really ugly and this is terrible and this, wow, this is wicked. Like, and then you're like, okay, so what's the point of the story? Why is this ugly story here? The why though is not answered in the story. The why is very specifically at the very end, the last two verses. The only reason this story is here is because Tamar had two sons, Perez and Zira. Are you ready to nerd out? Come on, 11 a.m., come on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's one simple reason. This, I had this, this epiphany on my own because I'm trying to do my own homework. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is why. It's because of the sons. Where do you think the lineage of Perez and Zira will end up leading? If I ask you a question at church, usually the answer is always Jesus. Yay. That's correct. It's through Judah that the lineage of Jesus comes. So if you're new to the Bible, this will be fun for you to see. If you're used to the Bible or acquainted with it, then you'll recognize the scriptures. Obviously, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, which comes from the root of David. So we know that the Christ comes from David and David comes from Judah when we're talking about the lineage of the 12 tribes. Now, Joseph for the rest of Genesis will be an example of Jesus when we study it, but Judah is the lineage of Jesus. In Genesis at the end, Jacob prophesies over his 12 sons and when he gets to Judah, he prophesies the scepter will not depart. So there's some kind of kingship that's going to continue through your lineage, Judah. And prophesies until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Who do you think that's talking about? Question and answer, Jesus. It is. Jacob prophesies about Judah that the Christ will come. And then check this out as if we can't nerd out even more, which we definitely can. Matthew chapter one, in the genealogy where it tells us where Jesus came from, in the middle it includes Judah, the father of Perez and Zira, whose mother was Tamar. And Tamar is one of only five women mentioned in the genealogy. Whoo, it's just cool. 
but lineage only comes from one human. So is it Perez or Zira? Well, Zira, as we know, generational effects can happen from the decisions you make and how you decide to live your life and that will flow down to your children. So if you're following God, it will, at least the influence of that will flow down to your children. And if you're not, the influence of that down to your children. So that happens in Zira because Judah, not really a good example. And in Zira, eventually his lineage leads to a guy named Achan. If you know the story in Joshua 7 where Achan steals the sacred items and gets him and his whole family stoned to death, Achan was the son of Zira. So that leaves Perez, which is why in the second genealogy in the New Testament of Jesus, it says the son of Perez, the son of Judah. And I think that's why the story is given to us like this, where it tells about the sons coming out. It's like, okay, the first son came, but Perez actually came first. It's through Perez. And this would be enough to nerd out over, nerd out over, but we actually know even more about this because there is no holes, there's no gaps in the, lean, the um, lineage, right? Of Jesus. And the Old Testament intentionally gives us this so that we have the evidence of the lineage of Jesus. Ruth, if you know the story, plays a part in this connection. In Ruth chapter four, there is a genealogy given that leads from Perez to Boaz who married Ruth and has a baby eventually leads to David and then that leads to Jesus. Mind blown. And the cool thing too is in the story of Ruth, Boaz follows the principle of taking a widow and continuing on the family name in a proper sense. In this story, he doesn't do it. In this story, the, the principle of that is not followed in a proper sense, but Boaz is a good example and because of that places part marries Ruth, takes in Ruth because she was a widow. This is incredible evidence for the legitimacy of Jesus. Incredible evidence, dude. The fact that we have no holes in the lineage of Jesus, the fact that this story is put here so that we can see another puzzle piece. And now we know, like you cannot tell me that Jesus wasn't a real person. No one in their right mind, you can't. There's more evidence for that than most other people that we believe in. No holes. That's why the story's put here. And on top of that, the fact that it's an ugly story, that in and of itself is evidence. Listen, it doesn't make sense that Christianity was made up. There's over 40 plus humans that wrote the books over the span of 1500 years in three languages on three different continents. So it doesn't make any sense that the Bible is so perfectly connected and it is without fault. For thousands of years, no one's been able to fault it. That doesn't make sense. But even if you just ignored that, it doesn't make sense if it was made up that you would write this story to be the lineage of your king and your savior, like that's the story you would write? God is a God of integrity. He, he comes in like an underdog because then there's no excuse. Isaiah says there's nothing about Jesus that made him more special. Like there was no, nothing that, that anyone could look and be like, well, you came from a really cool lineage of a bunch of really cool people. So obviously that's why you were the savior of the world. No, because it's so ugly, it actually is extra evidence that it must be true. God is a God of integrity. I did what I did. I still brought about the Christ, even though it was through this much evil, this much darkness and wickedness. And then suddenly it actually becomes nice and comforting to look at this kind of story and think, if God is unashamed of continuing the lineage of the Messiah through this kind of evil and wickedness, that's a comfort to me because I know my evil and I know my wickedness and I know that I have deep, dark, nasty things within me, things that I've thought and things that I've done. And God is not ashamed of that either. To do what only can be done by him to reach out to us and provide Jesus for us. Now the story itself. 
What can we learn from the story? Judah is the most responsible person in the story. So we learn from him. He's the man, he's the husband, he's the father, and he's one of the 12 patriarchs. He's one of the 12 sons of Jacob, leader of one of the tribes of Israel. It's kind of like a hit or miss as we study through the Bible, but Genesis especially, it's all stories where the one weekend we're saying, this is what we learn not to do from this person, and one weekend we're like, this is what we learn to do. New Testament tells us we learn from the Old Testament examples. This week we learn what not to do from Judah. First thing we learn from Judah is he's with the wrong people. His best friend and his wife are Canaanites. In Genesis 24 and 28, from Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob, it is explicitly commanded not to get a wife that's a Canaanite, which is not like a racial thing. That's not a racist or like hatred of certain people for un any unnecessary reason. God specifically didn't want that because the people were so wicked, because they were worshiping sex gods that just had shrine prostitutes and that was just the normal thing, or sacrificing their children to, to the false gods by putting them on burning altars and watching their children cry and burn to death because that was the right thing to do. Wicked, terrible people. God said, I don't want you to commingle with them. He's not setting himself up for success when his best friend is someone that shouldn't be his best friend and his spouse is someone that shouldn't be his spouse. In addition to that, he's in the wrong places. Like, what are you doing in the Canaanites places? What are you doing in, in Timnah, the Philistine area? Another group of people we see through the stories are people that God specifically brought judgment against or took Israel into the land of promise and kicked them out, or at least that was the plan. You're supposed to kick them out, wipe them off because they're wicked people. Samson, one of the judges, who is he fighting against the whole time? The Philistines. You're not setting yourself up for success if you have the wrong people in your life in the wrong places. And there's a balance to all things. So it's not that you can't talk with people that aren't Christians. It's not that you can't go to places that are not Christian or whatever that even means. Who are your closest people? And where is your place? Like, where is your spot? What are the places that you call home? They're foundational places where you get refreshed and re-strengthened. On top of this, the most prevalent is that Judah was living life on his own logic. This is the most prevalent. This is what we'll study as we look over the story. He puts himself with the wrong people in the wrong places and is using his own logic. Basically, he's just living life how he wants to live it. Classic human thing that we all wanna do. Naturally, we just live life the way that we think we should live life. We make decisions based off what we think is correct. Easy to do, but also dangerous. Verse eight, he loses his first son because his first son's so wicked. And so he tries to fulfill the cultural traditional duty by telling his second born, hey, you go and be with Tamar so you can carry that on. That's what we do, man. We're people of tradition. But obviously from the story, he doesn't care about the principle of the tradition, obviously. He doesn't care why it should be done. He's just trying to get it done for the sake of tradition. That's like if you're in the South and you go to church on Sunday because that's what you do in the South. Like I just go to church because that's what we do, man. So then you make a bunch of country music and you put like girls and trucks and beer and church and it all just fits and it all makes sense because that's the culture, that's the tradition. Like, of course I go to church on Sunday, man. Like that's what we do, but you don't actually care. You just do it because that's the thing to do. And then it shows you actually care more about yourself and what you think is the presentable thing. I like that I go to church on Sunday because of what people think of me. You don't care for it, so it's not actually affecting you. You actually are showing you care more about yourself than anyone else. Then verse 11, he assumes that Sheila is gonna die like the first two brothers, and so he holds off Sheila from marrying Tamar. But it tells us specifically the reason he holds off Sheila is because he thinks Sheila's gonna die. So he knows deep down. He knows, he figures like, I know I'm not living for God. I know my first and second born were wicked and they're not living for God. And I know that that's why God killed them. So I know Sheila's probably gonna die too. So he gives an excuse that sounds really good. It's something that might be true. Personally, I don't even think Sheila was too young. I think he was just young enough for Judah to use it as an excuse. Hey, 
The boy's a little young. Let's just let this go a little bit longer. You go live with your father. That's still culturally appropriate. Your father's alive. He can still take care of you. So that's him figuring things out. I'm going to figure things out. And that'll work for you. You go over there and then she'll wait till he, And then what does he do after that? Absolutely nothing. Because he's trying to just use his own logic. And then he's using what sounds like a good excuse. Wait till he grows up to cover up the fact that he just doesn't want to deal with it. He's just trying to do a quick fix. That's like going to work and working and then staying at work because you have so much to do and because you're so important and because there's so many things like for the greater good, I need to, I need to help finish this task so you actually don't have to go home and love your family. Like, you like using work as an excuse. You know that to go home and love your family, love your wife or your husband or your kids is gonna take effort. That's hard work. And that matters more. But when you're focused on yourself and you're selfish, you use the excuse of work that sounds good to just cover up. You're doing the same thing Judah did. You're just dissing your family. Thinking about yourself, using your own logic. Verse 23 he keeps going. He sleeps with a prostitute. He knows it's a wrong thing, tries to go and pay for it. By the way, sends his friend to go with the payment. Come on, dude, that's boy moves. Send your friend to go. Friend comes back, couldn't find her. All right, man, hey, we did our thing. We did what we could. He does the same thing in regards to the prostitute situation that he does with Tamar, ironically to Tamar again, poor girl. But with Tamar and Sheila, he's like, let's just, you know, do what we can and then I'll shove it under the rug and hopefully it won't come and bite me in the butt. Same thing happens. They don't find the prostitute. So he's just like, hey, we did what we could. My hands are clean. Shoves it under the rug which is fascinating how dull we are as humans that we can shove things under the rug and think that things that you're supposed to deal with but you don't deal with are not going to eventually come and bite you in the butt. It will always come and slap you in the face. Life will always slap you in the face. But we, we're so dull as humans, like we're so ridiculous. We can do this multiple times before we learn a lesson. Why do you think that you can hide your sin? It's because you're not thinking straight and you don't know you're thinking straight because you're obsessed with your thinking, which is not thinking straight, but you're obsessed with it. So you're convincing yourself that what you're thinking is the right thing, even though it's the wrong thing because you don't see it. You're obsessed with yourself. You cannot be in control of everything in your life. Only God can. So until you submit to God, that logic of your own dealing with life, like that's never going to work. That's all he does. Push it under the rug. Pushing things under the rug is a surefire way of making everything worse. It's a surefire way. That's like a law, a law of spiritual thermodynamics. That was, all right, if, if there's like nerds in here, that's a bad joke. I don't even know if it makes sense. But it's a law in the world. If you try and shove things under the rug, you try and do things your own way and try and stay in control, it's always gonna make things worse. It's not gonna work out. Same thing happens. We continue the story, verse 24. Then he hears of Tamar being a prostitute and getting pregnant. And what does he do? He freaks out. What? Tamar is a prostitute? Tamar is pregnant? Burn that girl. Burn her? Why? Why does this happen? Why does he have this kind of reaction? Here's the answer. Whenever you have hidden sin that you do not deal with in your life, you will always overreact to other people's hidden sin when it comes out because it makes you feel better about yourself. And while nothing is happening, you are continuing to believe the stupid lie that you're getting away with it. You didn't find her, shoves it under the rug. Three months go by. And instead of as the time goes by, instead of believing the truth that this is going to make it worse and worse and worse the longer I wait to deal with this, you convince yourself that the longer something, time goes by without something happening, that that's actually working. Like I'm actually free of this and you're never free of it. So then as you're waiting, you're literally doing the whole thing like you're just anxious beyond all get out and nothing is happening and you're convincing yourself that that's working, like nothing's happening. And then when someone else's sin comes up, then you're like, oh, heck yeah. That's my opportunity to make a lot of noise about that, to make sure that nobody else points at me and nothing else comes up so I can keep my thing hidden. And usually the intensity at which the sin is that you're hiding will match the intensity 
by which you react to someone else's sin. That's what he does. And as the law of the spiritual world goes, eventually, even though you're shoving it under the rug and you think that you're hiding it, you're actually just shoving more and more weight into the sledgehammer that eventually is gonna uppercut you in the face. And he gets uppercutted in the face. Maybe you know whose ID card this is, I'm not sure, check it out. This is the sad reality of Judah's life. He was just a scared, selfish man who made everything around him worse because he only lived for himself. This is easy to process as an American. When I look at the story, it's easy for me to understand this mentality and getting stuck in this mentality that Judah was in. Because in America, in our free enterprise, entrepreneurial, like American dream kind of culture, the obsession is over self. We worship the self. I saw some kind of preview of something, some kind of like um, ad just the other day that literally started out with saying, there's nothing more powerful than you. And then it was, I don't even know what it was for, like cookies or TV or a movie or something, or college. I've seen that in airports. America, we worship the self. And so this is, this is easy. Can you not imagine, especially as an American, that you're not all that in a bag of chips, but that's all America wants you to try and be. Judah was a man who tried to act like he was something. Let me run the story back and see if this sounds familiar. I got a hot wife from a hot town. I got three sons from that wife. Culturally, especially, that's a big deal. I got three sons. What now? I lose a son. Whoops. Let me fix it. Second son, you go take care of that. Okay, good to go. Whoops, he dies too. Let me save the third son. Hey, you stay with your dad. That'll work out. It's still good. You're young, you know, just don't worry about it. Hey, man, don't worry about it. Nothing happens. A long time goes by and then the wife passes away. And the scripture doesn't tell us, but I can't help but wonder if God was involved with that. I don't know, but I wonder if God was involved that as time went on, eventually he lost his wife. And, and apparently that wasn't enough of a wake up call. The wife dies, so he says, you know what? I'm gonna keep on just pacifying that. I'll go with my best friend to the Philistine city and just work and sleep around. Finds the first prostitute on the way to the place, sleeps around. Gets her pregnant. I could take care of this myself. And then, whoops, all that comes back. And now everyone can see that you're the fool because you've tried to handle it on your own and do your own thing. He thinks he has his life figured out and he's convinced himself of it, but he's obsessed with himself and therefore is making everything else worse. Anyone who lives only for themselves will always make everything worse. Always. But God. But God. You know the thing when we obsess over ourselves and people are trying to do things their way and you don't submit to God, you convince yourself that you're God without realizing it. You take the throne of God because you're trying to take the control of things in your life. You pacify things, you shove it under the rug, and then because time goes on, you think, okay, well, I guess that's good. Like, I'm good to go. I don't have to do anything. You keep on convincing yourself that you are God, making the right decisions and in control of your life. But even the fact that you don't see that you're not God, and even the fact that you've convinced yourself that you are God, doesn't stop God from doing what he wants to do. It is incredible and fascinating. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You cannot stop God from doing what he wants to do. It doesn't affect his capabilities if he wants the lineage of Christ to come through Judah, even if it comes through this kind of wickedness and these kind of people, he's still gonna make it happen because God's God, no matter what you do, no matter what you say. Three lessons we learned from the story. The first one is this, he's gonna get his will done. Job said in chapter 42, to God, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God is God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the same thing ever since the beginning. Ever since the beginning, God has always given the same two options. You either are with me or you're not. You can do what you wanna do. Like that's fine. It's not gonna work out. It's not gonna feel good. You're never gonna have peace or joy or love. 
But do you want to be a part of this? Because I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to get the things done that I need to get done. I'm still going to send a savior into the world and I'm going to offer that everybody can have their sins forgiven and have eternal life. You can be a part of that. But newsflash, you're not all that in a bag of chips. It doesn't matter what you do, good or bad, it's not going to affect the fact that God still is God and he'll do whatever he wants. He has every right to, if he is indeed the creator of the universe. Lesson number two. This is an easy verse to memorize as you get longer along in life and you get more experience and you realize, yep, can't do that, can't do it. You may be sure that your sins will find you out. I heard my dad say this a lot growing up. You may be sure that your sins will find you out. You can't hide, dude. You can't get in a boat and sail to the furthest city. Like if God still wants you to do it, he'll kick you out of the boat and make a fish swallow you and vomit you back up in the actual city after three days. And then it's still up to you if you even wanna be a part of it. Like, you can't get away. Romans 14, 12 says, we're all gonna give an account. Jesus said it himself, we're all gonna give an account. We're all gonna give an account. You're gonna stand before the God of the universe. Someone needs to hear that right now. Someone needs to hear that. You are gonna stand before the God of the universe. And then it, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. And it doesn't even matter what you think. Justice will be served and payment will be given to anyone that does not come with payment. And the only payment you can come with is Jesus Christ. He's the only perfection that has died for your sins. You're gonna stand before the God of the universe. I pray you receive that, dude. You can't escape, why? Why would you do it? Here's the thing, dude, There's, it's a two-sided coin. God will poke, he will pierce. Hey, stop, hey, stop doing that, don't do that. You big dummy, why are you doing that? The other side of the coin is a very comforting, loving, warm embrace of, hey, you don't have to do that. Like, what are you doing? You don't have to do that. Listen, if you have a sin or a bunch of sin in your life, you're just not giving it to God, you're not surrendering to God, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be stuck in that. If there is someone sitting in this room or listening that has one or multiple, small or big, anything that is secret that you are hiding from God and you're not surrendering, you do not have peace right now. I could say that as confidently as anything else. You don't have peace. No matter how much you try to convince yourself and no matter how much you try and pacify it with other things in your life, you don't have peace and you're never gonna have peace. Nothing else is worth it. The perfect family, the perfect job, the perfect anything, nothing's gonna give you that peace. So why, dude, why would you, why? If this stuff is real, if God is real, then your sins can be forgiven and you can be washed white as snow and you can fly like a butterfly. The love of God can be a tidal wave into your life, dude, if you just surrender, like, all right. All right, you're not gonna get away with this, so why would you try? You don't need to. Which is the third lesson then, brings us straight to the grace of God from this story. It will reach to the lowest depths for a relationship with you. Your life can still be used for God's glory, no matter your past. No matter how much you mess things up, you can never mess God up. If his grace is sufficient to bring about the Messiah through the lineage of this evil, his grace is sufficient and his love is enough to receive you. It's just up to you. No harm, no foul. Not between you and me, not between you and anyone else. It's up to you. It's just on you. Do you want to receive the grace of God? And it's so real. Everything, everything in the Bible points to Jesus because he's real. While we were still sinners, this guy right here, geez, what a verse. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You have no clue. 
You have no clue. You, don't, you know nothing. What do you know, little human? You have no clue how much God loves you. No clue. I don't know what it's like to have a human child, but I imagine that's scratching the surface. And your kids being a kid and you're just like, you're adorable. You have no clue how much I love you. Like parents, you relate like, right? Am I right on that? You have no clue. That is scratching the surface. If you're a parent, God bless. Lord willing, I'm hopefully we'll be there one day. Not yet, calm down. <laughs> but man, we have no clue. I'm gonna have Jonathan and Savannah come out. We're gonna end the service because it's the first weekend. So now on the first weekend of the month, we're gonna do a specific time of worship and prayer so we can be a house of prayer. I also, at this time, I'm gonna ask those that we have previously talked to to come and be available here on the sides for prayer. I don't know what God wants to do. I don't know if God's speaking to anybody in a specific way, but we're gonna do what the scripture commands us to do and be a house of prayer. Let me encourage. If you need prayer for anything, that's what this time is for that we're gonna make sure we do every month during the service. If you need prayer for anything, if you need to be healed, we believe God is God who still heals, physical healing emotional healing, spiritual healing, mental healing of anything. I don't care where you come from, come and ask. Let us pray with you. If you know someone that needs healing, if you need wisdom for something, if you have anything that you just need prayer for, I mean, I don't have to go preacher mode on that. If you need prayer, I challenge you, this time is gonna be set aside for you to take a physical step, which is significant spiritually and to be willing to get over yourself and allow someone to be there for you and pray for you. You can trust these people. Come and ask for prayer. I'm gonna ask us all to stand too. We're gonna worship while we do this. It would be wrong if I did not give a specific challenge from the scriptures that if you have hidden sin or you have never received Jesus, You've never actually received Jesus. I talked to someone not long ago that I'm very close to that grew up in the church. And they know everything about church stuff, but they never tried on their own to seek Jesus. That's what matters. Someone here needs to receive Jesus today. I pray that you do it, man. I can't make you do it. You come and tell someone, listen, I wanna receive Jesus. I don't even know what that means. Can you pray with me? But if you have a secret sin, why are you holding on to it? If you have a bunch of secret sin, you come and confess. The book of James says, confess your sins so that the doorway is opened for healing by the power of the Holy Spirit for your soul. If you have secrets in your life, it could be the smallest thing or the biggest thing. You come up and say, I'm angry and I'm refusing to let it go. I'm not forgiving this person of this wrong. I'm watching porn and I can't kick it. I'm sleeping with prostitutes. I'm addicted to drugs. I'm sleeping with someone who's not my spouse. You come and confess. Let's keep it guys with guys and girls with girls and allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants. God is free and I believe that if God's speaking to you and you step out, he's gonna work on your life in a very special way just because we asked him to and he's faithful to do so, amen?